Hello. Hello, everybody. How are you? Can you hear us? Well, I think you can see us. At least that seems to be what we can see here. And so, yes, of course, please go ahead and type into the chat. What you'll probably notice here is that we're using a system called Chat Relay. And if you're new to our live streams, this is how we communicate with the audience as we keep going. So feel free to type whatever you want, because we actually have moderators here who will make the communication safe. Right. So whenever whenever we're in these sessions, please feel free, feel free, feel free to say whatever you like. If you say something particularly good, our moderators will go and give you a star. Uh, if you say something particularly bad, unfortunately, our moderators will have to uh, give you an anti-star, which is not displayed. But after a while, you unfortunately don't get to talk anymore. But with that, I want to introduce what we're doing today. This is an official collaboration with MathCounts, and it's an enormous pleasure to be doing this collaboration because, at least for me, MathCounts was actually the introduction to, well, real interesting math. Before MathCounts, before math counts, I actually was mainly just doing practice problems, but MathCounts showed me that there were questions that were really quite difficult that were things that were interesting to think about. Now, many years later, I'm happy to be here as a MathCounts alum, and tonight, well, tonight or today, depending on how your time zone is, I'm I'm going to be solving some math problems, but most importantly, joined by two incredible people. I would like to introduce the other two people who are with me because you see, everything is a team effort. And in fact, having people, uh, having people who have this sort of experience makes it so that we can actually teach math in a much more interesting way. So with that, I'm just going to introduce them alphabetical order by first name. So Alan, can you make a noise so you take over the screen? Hello, everyone. Yes, this is Alan. Alan is a person who has actually been in math counts before. He represented Washington at, national, at math counts nationals 2021, and he was in the top 56. Uh, he's also a four-time AMI qualifier. The AMI is the middle is, is the high school math competition that leads towards the International Math Olympiad, and he also doesn't only do math. He also plays snare drum in his school marching band. And I'd also like to introduce my other co-host, Elena. Hello. Yes, Elena is also fantastic. She actually is involved in Math Counts as a coach. In fact, this is her third year coaching her local Math Counts team. And I actually first got to know her because she she did the high school math competitions and went all the way to MOP, which is the summer camp where we bring about 60 uh, strong US math students every, every single summer. So she is not only a math person though, she also has a sense of humor. She tells me she likes the color yellow but only when it's sunny outside. I guess right here where I am in California, it is sunny outside. Although where I was in Pittsburgh yesterday, I'm not sure if it was sunny. With that, we're going to go ahead and dive into some problems. What we're going to do here is this is a live solve. And live solve means that we actually intentionally have not looked at these problems before. Now, that means that you know we might make mistakes here and there. If that happens, please uh, be Please have some fun. Please have some fun with us. And at the same time, uh, you'll also notice while we're doing that, you'll see how we go about thinking about solving the question the first time we see it. So that's actually why intentionally we are trying to do these questions without having seen them before. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'll do the first question. Let's see if I can have any luck with this. Ah, what is the total cost of three jars of peanut butter priced $5 each and five jars of jelly priced $3 each. Oh, this is cute. I see three, five, five, and three. So I think this problem is probably here to teach us that three times five and five times three are both the same thing, which perhaps you knew. So, but if I have the three jars of peanut butter priced $5 each, that's three times $5. And then the other one is five jars of jelly priced $3 each, that's five times Three dollars. And so I guess in my head, I'm just saying, well, that's two of them. And I, I like how some people are typing in the chat. It's actually quite nice to look at this and say the grand total is going to be two times three times five. Now, if you have to multiply two times three times five, um, it's useful to think which numbers are good to multiply first. I, I understand this is easy, but at the same time, it's nice to use a warm up question to get everyone used to this. Yes, I like it. The person named Math Counts number one has said it's fun to multiply two times five first. And if you do that, that gives you 10. And so then the answer is 30. I think. Let's see. 
Yay! I got through one question. With that, we're going to go alphabetical order by first name. So that puts a lot next. Awesome. That's great. So this next problem, number two. Um, what is the absolute difference between 2 to the power of 5 and 5 squared? All right, let's see this. So, you know, before, Professor Law was saying how, you know, 3 times 5 and 5 times 3 are the same thing. But in this case, we have 2 to the power of 5 and 5 to the power of 2. I don't think they're the same. And it seems like a lot of people here are saying they're not the same, actually. So let's see here. People are saying here 2 to the power of 5 is going to be 32. Seems reasonable. You know, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. You get 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. You're right. Alrighty. So that's 32 over 2 to the power of 5. And now 5 squared, well, that's just 5 times 5. And as we all know, that's going to be 25. So finally, as everyone here is saying, the answer would be 32 minus 25, or 7, not 0. So they're not the same, actually. Pretty cool. Let's see if I'm right. And I am right. Awesome. I think I'll hand it off to Elena now. So here is the next problem. What is the value of the expression 1 fifth plus 11 fifteenths? Express your answer as a common fraction. I think we are staying pretty thematically consistent. We are seeing the return of the 3 and 5. So one might notice that when we try to add 1 fifth and 11 fifteenths, they don't have the same denominator yet. So that makes it difficult to add them. So what we want to do is we want to bring them to a common denominator. And one thing you might notice is that 5 and 15 have a common factor, which is 5. So we can simply multiply the numerator and denominator of the first fraction by 3, and this should bring us to a common denominator. In this way, we have 3 over 15 plus 11 over 15 is equal to 14 over 15. Yay, I think that looks right. I just went and checked the answer. So I guess we'll keep going. I guess that puts it on me. And thanks to everyone for participating in the chat too. Uh, for us, if you are joining in the chat, it makes it much more fun and hopefully the same for you. All right, Bob has $50 in his pocket when he sets off for the movie theater. After he pays 10 bucks for a ticket, $8 for popcorn and $7 for soda, how much money does Bob have left in his pocket? This sounds like subtraction. So it looks like I need to know how much was spent in total. And we have to remember to subtract that from 50. Mm -hmm. So how much was spent? Well, there was a 10, an 8, and a 7. OK. How to add these numbers? Well, I saw some people are already talking about how you solve this with subtraction. And indeed, you need to take 50 minus all of this. And if I look at these, I'll just tell you what I usually do. To me, I, I, I personally find 10 to be easy to add at the end. So I do the hard one first. Everyone is different. But I'll do the 8 plus 7. That gets 15. And then plus 10 is 25. And then how much is left over is just 50 minus 25, which is 25. So perhaps math counts was trying to use this to help us remember that 25 plus 25 is 50. So I see a lot of people are also saying the answer is 25. So I hope it's right. It is. On to you, Alan. Yeah, awesome. All righty. So first jump to the test, guys. Awesome. So we have this right triangle here. It has legs of length 5 centimeters and 8 centimeters. And we want to know what is the area of this triangle? Well, Okay, a lot of you guys probably know the formula for this. A equals BH over 2. But let's let's find out why this is true. So, in general, right, we, we all know how to find the area of rectangles, right? If you have a rectangle and it has lengths A and B, right, it's going to be A times B. Why? You can kind of think of it as each area is like a lot of these small strips of, of like, the, of like, you know, Smaller rectangle, as you can see. And as it gets smaller and smaller, you can kind of see as it, it like becomes A times B, that product A times B. So it's, it's a little bit rough there, but that's the idea behind all this. In this case, though, we want to find the area of a triangle. So how do we find that? Well, if you divide this into not like this, not like this, but like this, you get two triangles. Specifically, you get two 
right triangles actually, because remember, a rectangle has all right angles. And since you have two of them, they're both the same, that means that the area of each one is going to be just AB over 2. And in this case, A is 8, B is 5, or vice versa, doesn't really matter. And you get that the answer should be 8 times 5 over 2, or 20. Oh, 20. Yeah. And I think that's the answer. Hopefully I'm right. Oh, wait. There we go. Awesome. 20 centimeters squared. On to you, so our next problem is the figure shows a large square divided into 25 congruent squares. What percent of the figure is shaded? I have uh, recolored the picture slightly because I found the gray a little boring. Um, colors! So I guess the first thing that kind of trips me up here is we're thinking about like areas, I guess. We want the area of the shaded out of the total area, but we don't have any measurements for things, which is a little scary. Um, but the good thing is that we are being asked for percent. And what percent really is, is it's a proportion or a ratio. And so while you might be tripped up by thinking we don't have enough information here, actually we do. Uh, this is because we can sort of assume a scale. And we'll see that when we assume a scale, eventually we just divide out by it because we have the numerator and denominator of our ratio scaled by the same factor. When we simplify, it'll just be divided out. So we can assume a scale safely and then um, it'll be, you know, nice. <laughs> so we do have enough information to proceed. And my favorite scale to assume is that all of these are unit squares because unit squares are really nice. Uh, in general, the nicer your numbers are, the easier your math is. And when math is easy, that makes answers much correcter, like my grammar. Um, so <laughs> we have 25 unit squares is what we're assuming. And yes, I see confirmation for this. We have 25 unit squares. So presume this is our denominator and we're looking for the percent of the figure shaded. So we want to find how many of these 25 squares are shaded and then take this fraction, somehow convert it to a percentage. So from the picture, I see Rebecca says there's nine colorful blocks over 25 total blocks. Yeah, that is exactly it. We have nine colorful blocks out of 25 total blocks. And then there are suggestions to bring the denominator to 100, which makes a lot of sense because we are asked for percent. And you might know that the root for percent means that it is per 100, where cent means 100. So we want it as a fraction out of 100. That is, oh, Tommy points that out in chat as well, percent cent equals 100, exactly. So you want to bring this to a denominator of 100. And Maximus says times 4 over 4. That seems good. Multiplying by 4 brings 25 to 100. So doing this math out, we have 36 over 100, which I see in chat as well. I think this is correct. Oh, percent. We are almost there, but not quite. Uh, answer forms are very, very important. 36%. Great. I think that's right. At least that's what the answer key says too. Let's keep going. I guess that's me. Hmm. On the number line shown, the number n is one third of the way from zero to six. What is the value of n? Is this a trick question? It looks to me like it's just a third of six. Uh, I think it's two. I think it's just one third of the way to six. So uh, by the way, one third of the way just means that that is six. So this is a third of six and a third of six is equal to two. So that would mean that equals two. Yay! Okay, I think I got, I got that question. Let's go on to 11. Awesome. It was not your question. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, now we have this long word problem, this long, what is the value of one half, of one third, of one fourth, of 240? Wow, that's a lot of numbers. Okay. So in general, like there are a few different ways of forcing this kind of problem. And I see the most common way in like some places is just to say like a fourth of 240, kind of like to put parentheses around that, right? So you go like, a fourth of 240 and then you do so you find that and then you go a third of that and then you finally do half of all of that and that is a way of doing it that is a great way of doing it 
But I actually find it might be a little bit easier to do it a different way. And here it is. So, and I see people are saying here in chat already. See, everyone is saying it's multiplication. And what that means is the word of in general means multiplication. You multiply. So when you see the word of, like, I don't know, one half of 36, that would be one half times 36 or 18, right? So in this case, what we do is one half times one third. That's, that's a three. Don't worry. It's three times one fourth times 240. As everyone is saying, multiplication is commutative. So you can do it whatever, like whatever order you want, really. And moreover, these are all fractions, really. So you can cancel things out. You can cross multiply, right? So if you cancel this out with this, you get 240 divided by 4. That's 60, right? 60 divided by 3. That's 20. And finally, 20 divided by 2. That's 10. So the answer should be 10. I think, right? All right, awesome. Let's see it. Ooh, I want to jump in. Uh, I just want to jump in because something about this made me think. If you do the one half, one third, and one fourth, one fourth, and multiply them first, two times three times four is nice. Oh yeah, it's it's four factorial. It's twenty four. And right, so that, that was just something. Yeah. Oh, go on, go on. Hold on, you can finish up. Oh yeah, and two forty divided by twenty four, as we all know, is ten because you have an extra zero. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. All right, but on to you, Elena, with a nice graph problem. All right, so. This next problem is a graph reading problem for the function graphed here. And function just means um, generally what function means, or in our realm of functions for now, uh, usually function is represented as like f of x equals y. So it's kind of like a machine. You input some x value, and it gives you out a y value. So at least in our realm currently, this is how functions work. So for this function graphed here, what is the greatest value of x for which y equals negative 1? And so what we want to do here is we want to see all of the times that this function intersects y equals negative 1. And what this means is that f of x equals negative 1. And then we can look where this is located along the x-axis. And this should give us all possible values of x for which f of x is equal to negative 1. And so if we just look at this graph here, I think this is y equals negative 1, this little green line here. And so we can see that there is one value of x here-ish. So I think this is somewhere around x equals negative 3. And then a second value where it bounces off here, this would be x equals negative 1. Now, out of these two, which one is the greatest value of x? I see Tommy is suggesting negative 1 is the greatest out of negative 1 and negative 3. And I agree, although this is, this is slightly tricky wording, because we might be tempted to see this number 3 here and think 3 is bigger than 1. So negative 3 is bigger than negative 1. But this is, this is not how, how bigness of numbers works. While in magnitude, negative 3 is greater than negative 1. In actuality, because it's farther left along the number line, uh, it is farther away from 0 in the negative direction. So it is actually smaller. So I agree with a lot of chat here. Indeed, negative 1 is the greater x value. And this is kind of an interesting problem. Um, that's a function, a graph of a function. And if you are curious, this is like a, a really funky function. It has lots of points. And there are many other functions that exist. I think if you look a little bit into algebra, you'll see some more interesting functions. And you can learn about what kind of function this is. Fun. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Never mind. OK, let's, let's keep going. Uh, I guess I'm next. Oh, if 4n plus 1 equals 250, what is the nearest integer to the value of n? Mm. Okay. At first, I was like, I wonder if I could do this really fast by just dividing 250 by 4. Because by the way, if 250 was a multiple of 4, then the answer would just be divide and round, because this plus 1 won't make a difference. But 250 is not a multiple of 4. 
actually the way you can know this is that there's a rule for divisibility by four, which is to look at the last two digits. And 50 is not divisible by four, unfortunately. Okay, so in that case, I have to actually do some work. Uh, well, do more work. So I will say then that means 4n is equal to 249. Oh, maybe this is not that much more work. I think this is pretty, uh, not too bad to divide by. Dividing by two, four, dividing by four, well, if I just do it, divide by four, four times six is 24. And well, there's a nine here, four times two is eight. And I see that the remainder is one. So that means that if I were to divide it, n is equal to 62 and a quarter. So that means that the answer should be 62, I think. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Great. All right, let's go on to this one. We have some weird square roots and fractions. Well, what the heck? Square roots and fractions? You know, I always used to be so scared about this. I, I, I had no clue how to handle fractions and square roots. But let, let, let's try this out. Okay, so in general, there's a pretty nice like rule to this. And the idea is if you have square root of A over B, it's equal to square root of A over square root of B. Why though? Well, here's the reason. You see, A over B equals A times one over B, right? Remember, division is just multiplication, but you're multiplying by the inverse. So it's pretty cool. Now, if you were to square root that left side, right, it's equal to square rooting the right side. So the square root of the right side, we know how to do that. Because remember that you can always split apart multiplication. That's that's well known. So it's going to be square root of A times the square root of 1 over B. Now that over there, that one's going to be 1 over square root B. So overall, it becomes square root A over square root B. Because it becomes square root of A times 1 over square root B. So you're kind of like taking it out, sort of. Right? And... There it is. So this is this is how you kind of like split apart those fractions with with square roots over there, and actually any kind of root to be honest, because this method generalizes. You can do it for cube roots, fourth roots as well. Now, if we go back to the original problem here, right? Square root of one over four is going to be square root of one divided by square root of four, and we all know square root of one is one, but square root of four is two because two squared is four, so it becomes one over two. That's kind of like tongue twister, you know? Square root of four is two because two squared is four. Say that fast. Um, anyways, for square root of 1 9th, it's going to be square root of 1 divided by square root of 9. So it's going to be 1 over 3, because again, 3 squared is 9. So you got that. Then 1 over 16, that's going to be 1 over 4. Okay, so we got past that hard part. All we're going to do now is simplify this sum of fractions. Okay, we got to think of a, a, a common denominator here. Chat, can anyone give me a cool common denominator for these 2, 3, and 4? 12, all right, awesome. Yeah, because 12 is a multiple of 2, 3, and 4. So for 1 half, it's going to be 6 twelfths. For 1 third, it's going to be 4 twelfths. And for 1 fourth, it's going to be 3 twelfths. Finally, if you were to add those up, you get 6 plus 4. That's 10. Plus 3, that's 13. So overall, it's going to be 13 over 12, and that should be our answer. Let's see it. Whoa. There we go. 13 over 12. All right, so here is our next problem. The sum of two numbers is nine and their absolute difference is three. What is their product? Okay, this is an interesting question because I think I see maybe two ways to do this question. Um, see, whenever I think of sums and products, what I think of is perfect squares. Because when you take the square of a plus b, then you get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And this has a product in it. And so the two ways I see to do this one, one, we can solve for each of a and b directly by just doing a system of linear equations, or we can do some funky stuff with squares. So I think I will go through solving the system of equations first, and then I will do the funky squares one because it's a cool approach, and while it may not be the most efficient here, it is efficient in other problems that have uh, 
differences or sums and products. So the first way is we have a plus b is equal to 9 and a minus b is equal to 3. And well, I guess we can solve this. Like we can add these two and then we get 2a is equal to 12 and then a is equal to 6. And then we can also subtract them and then we get, how does subtraction work? Uh, 2b is equal to 6, so b is equal to 3. And then to find a, b, we just multiply 3 and 6 and we should get 18. Now, before we check this answer, I want to check this answer myself by doing it the other way with squares. So the way we want to approach this with squares, the, the interesting pattern I notice. So suppose we take a plus b squared. We know that this gets us a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And we can get this just by foiling, right? So a times a plus a times b plus b times a plus b squared gets us this. Now, if we take the difference of squared, the difference of two numbers and square this, we get a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. Now, this is pretty cool because we have two very similar expressions, but just the sign on the products is different. And what this means is that we can just subtract them from each other and then we'll isolate the products. And what's even cooler about this is not only do we cancel out these annoying terms on the right hand side, but we have all of the information for the left hand side. So if I remember correctly and chat, please uh, tell me if I'm incorrect. This is 81 or 9 squared and this is 3 squared or 9. And so when we subtract this from here, we should have Straight lines are really hard. If we subtract 9 from 81, this should be 72 is equal to stuff is equal to a squared minus a squared is 0. 2ab minus negative 2ab is positive 4ab. And then b squared minus b squared is equal to 0. So we get 72 is equal to 4ab. This gets us the same answer of ab is equal to 18. Now this seems a little bit long for this problem, but it's really, really nice because if the numbers we were working with were maybe a little bit uglier, you know, sometimes we have square roots instead of integers or other such things. It might be difficult to manipulate for the numbers directly and it is easier to find some nice way to work with the expressions. Often squaring with square roots is very nice to get a nicer number for the product. Yeah, I like that. Actually, I really like that you did it this other way as well because uh, it's it's also very clever. I just will share one thing. When I saw when I saw Elena going that way, I was like, oh, that's cool. You're going to subtract them. And then it occurred to me that if you say, take 81 minus 9, I mean, Elena somehow was like, yes, it's 72. Uh, that's too big of a number for me to deal with. So I was just like, that's 9 times 9 minus 9 times 1. So that's 9 times 8. Uh, if you see that, then you divide by 4. It's a little bit easier. But in any case, this was great. I have also just realized, did my camera just freeze? Yeah, you're kind of yeah. you're kind of running. <laughs> wow, I'm going fast. In that case, let's do this. I think I need to restart my OBS. So, well, that's, that's the technology we're using. Alon, can you jump ahead of me? And I'll come back and take the next one. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'll do that right now, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna change plans a little bit here. Problem 13. Of the fish in Ari's aquarium, one half are red, a fourth are blue, and an eighth are black. The remaining four fish are yellow. Given that all the fish are a single color, how many fish are in Ari's aquarium? Wow, okay. So let's say we have you know X fish, right? Because we, we wanna find the number of fish. So we're gonna let there be X fish, okay? So of those, we have half of them are red, a fourth of them are blue, and an eighth of them are black. So I'm just gonna write that out. Red, blue, actually, let me put this in like the actual color. Although I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well. So you got red, you got blue, and you got black. Oh, black is gonna be hard to see actually. Black, oh yeah, you can't see that very well. 
I'll, I'll, I'll use this color for that. Black. All right. So we got those. Now, how many fish are in Ari's aquarium? It's asking us, right? We're also given that the remaining four are yellow. All right. First thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to just add these up. Because that tells us how many of them are red, blue, or black. So any of those three. Well, one eighth. Sorry, one half plus one fourth plus one eighth. Chat, can you all tell me a nice common denominator for these? One half, one fourth, one eighth. A nice common denominator. Eight, all right, there we go. So then you got four eighths plus two eighths plus one eighth. Add them up, you get seven eighth overall. And you get seven eighth X for the whole thing, for red, blue, and black. But remember, you also got the yellow, right? And whoa, that's really cool actually. You see, if 7 8 x are all of these, that means 1 8 x must be yellow. That's really cool. Why does that happen? Well, you see, if you were to add these up from right to left, instead, what happens here is 1 8 plus 1 8, that's a fourth. 1 4 plus 1 4, that's a half. And then 1 half plus 1 half, that's 1. So it's really cool how you have this, like, cascading pattern. It's almost like a, a weird telescope, but not, not really, because it's like only one fraction. It's really cool. It kind of like collapses nicely. That's pretty awesome, actually. But yeah, anyways, to finish off the problem here, 1 8th x is 4. So if you were to solve for x, you get that x should be 32, because it's 8 times 4. And I think 32 should be your answer. Oh, yep, 32 fish. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. And I think I'm back. Let's see what happens. So now I'll take the next one. Uh, thanks a lot for saving me. A bag is filled with 100 marbles, each colored red, white, or blue. The table shows the results when Sia randomly draws 10 marbles. Based on this data, how many of the marbles in the bag are expected to be red? Ah, okay. Interesting. So, so this is something where I have this nice chart and somehow this is 10 of the marbles. And so if there's a hundred marbles total. I guess the thought process is, well, what should you do? If this is what you see from 10 of them, then probably what you see if you had all hundred is perhaps every number times by 10. Okay. Well, in that case, if I was going to just go ahead and do that, I have two red marbles. So I think I would take the two red marbles times 10 to give me an answer of 20. I think that might be it. By the way, the, the thing, the thing is, this is a natural thing that you do. This is called sampling. So in general, if you're trying to survey a population, it takes too long to ask every single person. So you try to ask a subset. And then what you do is you say, well, let's just, let's just I use as an estimate that in the whole group, I should just scale whatever I see in the subset by the ratio between the total number of people in the subset versus the total number of people in the whole thing. So the ratio here is from 10 to 100. So this times 10. All right, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay, I guess I seem to be getting all the easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute. All right, this one has a lot of words. Margaret holds tea parties every Tuesday afternoon for the purpose of using her collection of 100 teacups. That is an interesting motivation, but all right. If she invites n people, she will use n plus one teacups, one for each invited guest and one for herself. If she already has 24 tea parties, if she has already had 24 tea parties, each with two guests, how many tea parties with three guests should she host to ensure each teacup is used exactly once? All right. So I guess the idea here is we want to find how many she has already used, figure out how much is left over, and then I guess divide this up. Maybe there will be some remainder, but we can figure out how many tea parties left she can host. So currently she has hosted 24 tea parties and each has two guests. So 24 times when she invites n people, she'll use n plus one teacups. So she invited two guests to each of those tea parties, which means that she used three teacups in each one of them. I suppose she gets a new teacup for herself each time, which is interesting, but very hygienic. So 24 times three, ah, uh, numbers. 
This is going to be 60 plus 12. 72. Oh, it's the return of 72. Very cool. We have 72 already used. So how many does this leave unused? 100 minus 72. I have from Eric in chat that this is 28. So now for what the question actually asks, how many tea parties with three guests should she host to ensure each teacup is used exactly once? Well, when she hosts a tea party with three guests, she ends up using four cups. So we want 4x to equal or be less than or equal to 28. Maybe, maybe we will have slightly less than 28, which is still okay. We just don't want to go over 28. So 4x is less than or equal to 28, and we want to find the greatest x such that this works. And this will give us, oh, it's exact. Caitlin suggests it's exact. 28 over 7 is equal to 4, so x is equal to 7. And I think this is correct. Yeah. Yes. It's good. Ah, OK. That's cute. And I actually want to say thanks to everyone for participating in the chat. Uh, it actually makes it more fun for us and hopefully for all of you. So now I'll do question number 16. And actually, when we were planning this live solve, we somehow assumed that it would take uh, the hour to do 16 questions. It looks like we are going to end up having extra time, but that's okay, because I'll say that any of the extra time that we have, if people have random questions and answers for any of us, we're very happy to take them. It could be about anything, like math counts, math competitions, or anything. And I see that Alicia says, yay. Uh, so that means that hopefully people will enjoy that part too. All right, what's this? What? So many words. Okay, finally, I have to do something where there's lots of words. <laughs> Evan gets stuck in an elevator. That sounds terrible. At 12.11 a.m., the elevator repair company dispatches a technician who is 75 miles away. What? Why is the technician so far away? Anyway, the technician drives at an average speed of 50 miles per hour. And after arriving, it takes 10 minutes to enter the building and then an additional seven minutes to unlock the elevator. At what time is Evan released from the elevator? Okay. I guess the part that I have to do some work for is the 75 miles away. Like when you have all these word problems, you got to be like, what in the world is going on? So this is 75 miles away and there's an average speed of 50 miles an hour. So in that case, I will use that to figure out how many hours it took to get uh, for the technician to drive. So the time, the drive time. Drive time is going to be, you take the distance divided by the speed. Right, so the distance divided by speed, that would be 75 as the distance. The speed is 50. And you need to be careful. This is not minutes. Everything else is measured in minutes. That is the one tricky thing inside this question. Uh, and so that is hours, which if I want to convert into minutes, or actually, I don't think I need to convert into minutes because it's talking about time anyway. So this is, uh, I think it's, can anyone turn this into a mixed number just so that I'm not the only one talking? If I have 75 over 50, what is that as a mixed number? Because that's how I'll think of it. Yes, thank you to all these people who started answering. It's one and one half hours. Okay, well, in that case, oh, wow, chat is so lively. Good good job, guys. So then that means if you start at 12, 11 a.m., then by the time the driving is done, uh, what time is it? You can please tell me in the chat. So after driving is done, the time is one and a half hours later. Uh, so that's 1 41 a.m. Let me draw that. Let me draw that colon in a nicer way. 1 41 a.m. And then finally, there's another 10 minutes to enter the building and seven more minutes to unlock the elevator. So I need to add 17. And if I add 17, then eventually, I get to 1.58 a.m. Is that right? For 17? I think so. 1.58. So let's check. Yes, it's correct. Uh, I see that people are always asking these questions of what is Evan doing up so early? Uh, well, never know. But I'll say, actually, I was up pretty early last night because I just flew to San Francisco last night. So I got here at like 1 a.m. 
<laughs> in any case. Okay. That's a long time to get stuck in the elevator. Let's do random Q&A now. There's three of us here. We've all done math contests. The people have random questions that they want to ask, and we'll jump into them. Ooh, I'm excited. That's pretty awesome. I also just realized that it's 12 a.m., so I thought it was noon, and I realized, oh no, it's midnight. <laughs> this is really unfortunate for Evan, and for it the really technicians. Is. It really is. Yes. Maybe that's why the technician was so far away. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, we got some questions here. Uh, any tips for Math Counts Nationals? Does anyone want to give any tips for Math Counts Nationals? Okay, I'll say one thing about this. Um, so I qualified for Math Counts Nationals like when I was in eighth grade year, and I'm from like a pretty competitive state. So like Washington is is pretty like um, lots of people who want to do it, and in general, it's it re like it requires a lot of skill, obviously. But at that like high of a like quantity of people who are doing it. There's a lot of luck involved too, to be honest. Like the amount of variability, just you know, how you're feeling that day, how many mistakes you made, all of that, it can really impact it. So I don't really recommend to have math counts nationals specifically as a goal. I think a better goal is like X score or like improvement in this and or, or even just like learning this concept because math counts is like one of those really variable um, competitions that I think I personally got really lucky on that on that year. I was able to go like no sillies actually that on state that year it was, it was it was pretty insane but um you know a lot of people other, other people like made a lot of mistakes and that was very sad for them so it's one of those things that i don't recommend saying like i want to make math counts nationals because you can get easily like let down if you just make like a few small mistakes but if you do want to you're gonna have to do like a lot of prep just for math counts because that stuff is like really fast and like a lot, a lot of stuff. But all, again, it depends on like where you're, where you're from as well. Cause some states are like less competitive than other states. So yeah, but other, I, either way, I think math count is a really awesome place to develop your math love and math ability. So keep doing it, keep doing it. It's amazing. Uh, just, I recommend to have in mind what your goals are and maybe adjust accordingly to make it be more of an, uh, a goal that you can achieve with not like without taking into account other people's achievements as well a goal that you can achieve on your like by yourself if that makes sense to add on to this a little bit um it also depends on you should consider where you're at now when thinking about your math counts journey so there are like multiple stages i guess to math counts or like multiple aspects in which one can improve so generally for most people when they start out there's a lot of stuff to learn in just the basics. So this is what, for example, Daily Challenge does very well, is covering uh, essentially just the core concepts of each idea. And what Math Counts does that is quite special uh, in terms of middle school math is that it has very quirky problems. So you come across combinatorics and number theory and fancy geometry that you would not come across in normal school. And so if you have not really encountered this yet, it's the most beneficial thing is to look into these concepts, take courses, really get a good and solid understanding of the fundamentals. And then after this, there are a couple alleys in which you can go. One of them is there's lots of quick tricks that you have to learn for math counts. So speed is very, very important. And so one of the things that you should try to do if you want to go quite far in math counts is building up your like dictionary of tricks such that when you look at a problem, you see immediately what to do, or you can think of some realm of stuff or some realm of approaches that might be useful. And especially for math counts, this applies to other math competitions as well, but those you have generally a little bit more thinking time. Math counts is very, very fast paced. So it is very good to build up a repertoire of different approaches that you can use. So there are some like very, it's it's usually very niche and small things, but you just need to know a lot of them. So geometry, there's all these sorts of area formulas and things with in circles and areas from in circles and stuff like this that is good to know. Or quick computational tricks are also very helpful. And so this realm of knowledge is one thing that if you want to further your math counts journey, you should be focusing on. But the other one that I think people sometimes tend to focus less on is test taking ability. So the ability to work under time pressure is very, very important for math counts because again, it's a competition with a lot 
of time pressure. And this is, again, not something one tends to encounter in daily life, at least in middle school. By the time you're in high school, this is something you encounter very often because a lot of your tests are very time pressure -y. So I guess math counts is very good in this aspect because you're introduced to test taking a little bit earlier and you're able to develop these qualities. But it's very good to focus specifically on training your ability to work under time. And in particular, one thing that is very, very good to train is sillies. Everyone makes sillies and it is an easy way to lose lots and lots of points on your tests. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, sillies are just silly mistakes, which are problems that you could have solved, but you made some simple error that you could have avoided, like an addition error or misreading your own handwriting, which happens a little bit too often. This is why I cross my sevens. Or other things like misreading the question. Um, I guess it's kind of difficult to weed out sillies, but from things I have learned, one very good thing to do is invest in learning how to write better. Um, so writing down all of your work is helpful, uh, adapting your handwriting so that you can read it. And if you go back, you know what's going on in the problem. This is very, very good. I had one friend in middle school who wrote like very, very large and it was, this was his sixth, for example, and on team rounds. Um, did not work very well. We had to like ask him to repeat everything he did on paper verbally. So um, don't be don't be like this. Read your own handwriting and write so that you can read it. Um, I guess the best way to go about this is practice a lot of tests and look back at your mistakes. See what you did incorrectly and see if there are any common patterns in the mistakes that you tend to make. So if you see that you know, you keep on misreading your handwriting or flipping signs, that is something you can focus on. And it's good to look back at what you've done and learn from your own ways that you've done things, how to do it better. Great. Yeah. And I, yeah, that, that was, by the way, amazing. Like there were so many gems there. I think that this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Elena. But now I want to answer a question that Tommy asked earlier, which can you paraphrase as how to speed, like <laughs> using Elena's grammar. <laughs> so how to speed there are like many tips for this and like the way i look at this there are two categories of improving your speed there's the small things which is like you know just getting faster competition and you know those tiny tricks and then there's bigger scale things and I, you know a lot of people look at these like small scale things like i don't know they do a lot of for the win if you know what that is from like, art, art problem solving they do like a lot of that they you know do these massive like multiplication tables where they memorize lots of perfect squares lots of pictorials etc and that kind of stuff you know it's important right if you want to be really fast if you want to you know if you see like you know nationals cut down around if you want to be that fast yeah that 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 is pretty important but i think another huge aspect that is somewhat negative in a lot of cases is the bigger issues which is kind of like pattern recognition in general right because okay there if you focus on just the small things right you'll be able to solve those like fast one trick things instantly right but there's a lot of questions that are not just like that like that have these patterns and these these more subtle things that you can solve fast if you know these more advanced tricks and if you know like these bigger like more conceptual frameworks an example of this is telescoping telescoping what is that the, there's actually a whole lesson in this in daily challenge so i won't go too in depth into this but the idea is if you have like certain fractions they can cancel out very nicely if you split them apart nicely now these fractions if you were to add them up it would take you a long time because for a lot of them right there's either like you know six really like ugly fractions that look completely unrelated or just a hundred fractions that you have to find a pattern because if you don't, you know, it's going to take you like hours to solve, right? But people who know these things, who, who know how to look at the problems differently, they will be able to solve the problem much faster and much more accurately. And so it's kind of this like bigger rule in general of like um, kind of like motivation and um, being productive. It's called the 80-20 rule, the 80 slash 20 rule. There's like, like the idea is that 20% of your work is gonna produce 80% of the results. And that 20% of the work is what is like not looked at very much in a lot of cases. 
So this like foundational things, these things that, that are just so important, you need to get those down. And that is what those national like competitors are doing so well. Like, you know, doing all those like tricks, being able to you know memorize those perfect squares, factorials, cubes, uh, whatever it is, that's great. It's fast. You'll be able to do it really fast. But it is really important as well to have these foundational things, skills down and know them really well and really deeply. And I think those like knowing that, it'll go beyond just math codes. It'll go beyond just like, you know, AMC and Amy. It'll even go like to like your everyday life because it'll show you critical thinking skills. And that is like applicable anywhere. Like anywhere you'll go, you'll have to be able to think critically. Like it's just very important. And I think those skills are what are often like not looked at as much and i think they're very important yeah i'll add a few things on this too so i think that this is a really interesting discussion because somehow there's the silly mistakes there's the speed and then also celestial just mentioned that you can even get tired and then you get problems wrong so the way i see all of this is that when you have sports like athletic sports where you have to move your muscles then those teach you how to be able to move your muscles more and not get tired and that's just generally useful because sometimes you need to go and do things with your body like efficiently and do a lot of things like move fast or carry lots of stuff and so it's useful to be healthy physically but it, what these math counts problems do is they teach you the mental the way to be like very very athletic mentally so for example this thing about getting tired actually it's true i mean it takes it takes practice to be able to get used to burning your brain muscle that doesn't make any sense it's not even muscle but like making your brain move really really fast and if you get good at it not if you get good at it by doing it a lot you actually get able to have much more thinking stamina and then for example when you go and take a college class you don't uh you don't have your head feel like it just exploded because too much stuff just went in and also about the speed thing i i guess the way i always approach speed was actually not really through specific focused things it's rather about the general concept of figuring out how to suddenly make your brain just generally go faster right uh and by the way, sometimes you need to do that in real life, such as this afternoon, right before, well, this evening, right before this whole event started, I discovered that accidentally, I, I was the one who programmed the website, by the way, and there was a bug in the code, which meant that a lot of people hadn't gotten the links of how to join the session. Oops, that was my fault. And suddenly I had to really, really, really fast update the website. And at that point, it's like, it's not even just like math counts. That's just a competition. Over here, we have, uh, you know, we have something where there's lots of people who need something. Okay, when I say just a competition, I think it's a wonderful competition. But what I'm trying to say here is that um, in real life later on, sometimes you actually have something you really, really need to do. And it's nice to have that skill. Okay. More yeah, questions. and I think on on the point of tiredness, a while back, Eric put in chat, eat food. And I think this was meant as a joke, but I agree with this wholeheartedly. There is some element of, I think this is kind of an overlooked element of, you need to take care of yourself when you are competing. Before you're competing, during the competition, after the competition, mentality is very important. Your personal health is very important, and it has a major effect on how you do on competitions. So things like eating food, having breakfast the day of the competition and before the competition, and in the week leading up to the competition, and hopefully all of the time before the competition. Eat food, drink water, sleep. Sleep is very important. You mentioned being tired during the competition. Um, thinking is generally harder when you're tired. So taking care of yourself, just in general and before competition, very important. Ooh, I saw the hydrate y'all. I, I, I totally agree, <laughs> Caitlin. Like for me, the water is really important. I find that actually about the water thing, here's a tip. Sometimes for some competitions, you travel on a bus or you travel on a plane to get there. Be really careful not to dehydrate yourself on the trip or else you'll suddenly find out for some reason you have a weird headache. It's like you don't notice that you're thirsty if all you're doing is talking to your friends for like five hours on the bus and then you you, you just like suddenly find out the next day you are very, very tired. Uh, there was once a, once a math contest guy who walked around with a gallon jug of water all the time. <laughs> that I don't recommend because then um, then you might find yourself also needing to run to the bathroom. So you, you, have, to, you have to make sure you, you balance this in the right way. Yeah, and I think in general, just like taking care of yourself both physically and also mentally, I think. Like make sure that, you know, before the competition, don't do like a whole marathon of math, you know, cramming for the test. It works maybe in school a little bit, but it won't work for like math counts. That's not going to work. So just... 
before the test, you know, take care of yourself mentally too. Do some like video games with friends or with, you know, talk to people and make sure that you're like relaxed mentally and have that right mindset because that is super important as well. Just like, you know, if, you, if any of you do like sports, like cross country, maybe I'm, I'm a huge runner, um, then you'll know attitude and like mentality is everything. We, like in cross country, we have like all these like, chants and things that, that you do all the time. And it's really important as well in math because, you know, we're called mathletes for a reason, you know, math athletes, it's pretty important. So yeah, just make sure, you know, don't be negative, but also, you know, like be calm and relaxed and what you do before the test will impact your mentality during the test. So, yeah. Anything else? Do I like lemons? I love... I don't like lemons too much. I actually like oranges, though. Oranges are really good. Yeah. I like general, grapefruit. Just... Grapefruits are better. Grapefruit? I, yeah. I actually... I've never had one before. You know? You've never had grapefruit? They're I like know. lemon oranges, but they're pink. It's the best of all of the worlds. You know what I had recently? This is like kind of relevant, but I had like not orange carrots. So carrots that were like different colors. Did they you have purple carrots? Good. Purple yeah, carrots yeah, are the best I ones. Did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, and they taste the same. It's so weird. Like, like mm -hmm. I expected it to be like different, but it's actually like very similar taste. I don't know. It was like it was kind of like a weird moment for me. Yeah, you know, it's very strange. You would, you would expect, there's like a white one, and I thought this one would be like, for some reason, the, the idea of a white carrot is very peculiar to me, but it tastes exactly like an orange carrot. Exactly, yeah. And what I did um, was, I, so I cut them up, and I like boiled them, and then I ate them with tofu, and that was like really good. So it looked kind of like, so like the, the white ones and like the purple ones look kind of like onions and stuff, but they actually taste different, and so it was, it was pretty cool. It was like a weird, like, you know, my, my eyes and my tongue didn't agree. It was kind of it was kind of interesting. That does Amazing. sound really cool. Ooh. Okay. I actually also saw Maximus had said here yeah, as a question. Did you have a question you wanted to type in? You're welcome to type it in the chat. Just in general, type it in the chat. We're actually looking at all of this stuff. If for some reason we haven't answered your question yet, you can post again. Oh, here's one. Bing Wang, how many hours did you train math a day? That's a good question. I think when I was in middle school, I probably did math for like one hour a day outside of school. Uh, of course, that was a long time ago, but uh, that was about one hour a day in middle school, but every day. And on the weekends, maybe like two hours. I think this I varies know. drastically between people. Like there is not a set number of hours you need to hit to be able to do something. Like there is no criteria. There's definitely no one fit all. It is, I think, more about what kinds of resources you're looking at. And your, I guess, okay, so I guess one of the things that makes the hours question a little bit difficult is it matters what you're practicing. And there are many variable factors as well as for like how many hours it takes you to absorb the same amount of knowledge as someone else. So I think generally, like the hours question is very interesting, but um, everyone has different answers and I would not suggest comparing the number of hours you do to the number of hours someone else does. Like it is interesting information to know, you know, how much time someone spends on math instead of having a life or something. Um, <laughs> but don't compare yourself by number of hours. And I actually wanted to emphasize the have a life part because you know, <laughs> All people like, you know, they think, you know, math is everything. And that's great. You know, math is amazing. I love math. I don't know about you guys, like, huge shocker here, but I love math, you know? But um, it's also important to do things outside of math, too, because, you know, like, unless if you're going to become, like, a genius mathematician, chances are you're also going to be doing other things in your life. And it is pretty important to, you know, diversify in general. And you'll see that also the top math people are also, like, good at other things because... Math is awesome, but there are also other awesome things in this world. And I think just keeping, like, narrow is not a good thing. You want to diversify. You want to, like, do lots of cool things. Because in the end, you know, there are, like, a lot of experiences, a lot of things to do. And, yeah, 
touch grass yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that's pretty good uh, and also I, I, just, I actually did see maximus's question he asked do you have to speed through a test and i'll just say you should figure out for yourself what is a good speed that you can go through and have maintain control like your accuracy while also being able to do things fast this is something everyone needs to figure out uh, for example i know how to speed through a test really really fast with very bad accuracy you just write <laughs> the number one for every answer and it's very fast <laughs> That's the that's like the fastest way to answer all the questions, except that most of them will be wrong. So uh, you have to figure out what to do. Okay, we're down to the last minute. And uh, I, I guess what I'll do with this last minute is I'll just say, these have been very interesting questions. Um, if you liked what you saw, if you liked what you saw, we actually will be coming back again. There are actually more of these live solves coming. And I just put here some QR codes for the for the next things. We actually, by the way, have a newsletter. If you like the kinds of stuff that you saw here, every two weeks we put out a newsletter and we'll, of course, be talking about opportunities like this. And also the Math Counts Live solves, well, we can continue with them on that page there. Now, I will I'll also pull this back off of the screen. Just a second. I'll pull this back off the screen because of the fact that, uh, I, I, I apologize, we actually... We actually stopped questions at question 16 today because actually that's all we had prepared in creating this nice clean slide set that we were using. We were pacing this at the pace of about 16 questions for the first hour and 14 questions for the next hour and so on. We have three hours. So if you want to do more questions with us, just come back at the exact same time tomorrow and then we will be doing more questions together. It'll be a different batch of us, actually. It'll be myself and two other co-hosts. And I will actually say on that one, I'm not 100% sure whether I will be the one doing some of the questions, although I will be making commentary. The reason is because I will be in an airport, quite possibly, uh, flying back to Pittsburgh. But in any case, with that, I want to thank again our two co-hosts who actually make this much more interesting, Alan and Elena. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.